basically what I want to do is, um, you know, here you know the cast of characters. Um, we have Lorna from the Mayo Clinic. We have Jim from Goodyear, um, uh, Moises from Whirlpool, and Phil from Brown Brothers Harriman. We want to kind of hear from you if you if these guys were like the the League of Justice and they could show up at your company to solve any problem or make any case to your CEO. Um, what would you have them do? Just imagine if, if you had the four of these folks showing up in your office, what would they charge per hour as a consulting firm? I don't, I don't know. Um, but so, you know, I can warm them up with questions. I ask questions all day, but I'd really love, you know, if there are some people who are bold enough to say, you know, here's an issue that we're thinking about at our company, or here's something that we're working on, you know, here's an innovation initiative that we're doing, w which way would you guide us, give us some input? You know, this is a lot of um, brain power gathered up on stage plus me. Um, so who's going to be first? I met some people already today, so I'll start picking on you if I don't see some hands. That's the Harvard way. OK, um, yeah, why don't you go first? Tell us who you are and what you Hi, know. I'm Aaron Brown with Cox Enterprises uh, out of Atlanta. And our upper management is very focused on IRR free cash flow. So with that filter, knowing that all these efforts are long-term, generally, before you see fruits, what would be your opening executive summary to writing a business case for starting an innovation group? What a great question. So with a very IRR-focused management, what's the argument you would make? OK. Uh, so I used to be an investment banker, and so you know the answer was 42, and we had to justify the create the assumptions to justify the output. I think, in, in a lot of cases, the the ROI and the the IRR are just impossible to quantify. Um, you know, I, we're a team. I, I used to work. You know, I've worked in finance my whole career. I have a colleague who's a rocket scientist. We can't do it, and I, I really don't think it's 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 clearly meaningful that over time you're going to get commercial outcomes. But I think if you're if you're living in a pure ROI IRR world, it, it is extraordinarily difficult to to do that. And I think that you know you're doing things that are positive. You know you're doing things that are beneficial. It's just they're incredibly hard to quantify. Making knowledge more visible, connecting the dots across an organization, you know, teaching people new skills, how to be entrepreneurial. If you teach 20, 20 middle managers in your company how to build a new product if they've never done it before, you know that's positive, but it's just totally impossible to quantify other than knowing it's good and you should do more of it. Uh, so I guess I, I would look at it and say, I, I don't know if it's, it's possible. I guess it's sort of the pound num error in Excel if, um, for, for, for lack of a better answer. I, I, think I, I think the starting place is trying to understand, do they have a need? You know, do they, is, is there a problem that won't be? Can we push the bottom here? OK, does that work? Now is it working? OK, yeah, sort of working. The, uh, I, I think if, if there's not, if, if people are fine doing what they're doing, if they're getting the results that they want, if they project to get the results that they want with what they're doing, you, you know, it's a, it's a hard argument. It's even a hard discussion to have. If there's an aspiration that goes beyond what uh, business as usual will, uh, will provide, then you can start having a discussion about where do they want to go and what's necessary to get there. But if, if, if innovation is a stack ranking of IRR, then I'll tell you what the answer is. If you tell me what business you're in, that's what's on the top. <laughs> that's it. You know, you'll, if you're making postage meters, it'll be postage meters. If you're making tires, it'll be tires. If you're making loans, it'll be loans. <laughs> I don't know. So the, that, that's the, uh, because you know more about it, it's less risky, it's, uh, you, it's comfortable, it won't require change. So. So I think that you, you almost have to understand the context to be able to challenge it. Do, do you want to follow up, or are these answers helpful? All right, do you want to press on anything else or kind of ask a follow-up? No, I think I'm hearing what I already knew. Um, there is there is a magic element in there somewhere that it, it's a need, a long-term need, I think is what I'm hearing you say, Jim. Um, so we have that. It's just making that connection from the top to those of us who are going to get it done. All right, but if you already knew that, now you can say that, that Jim and Phil told you so. <laughs> they have told me so. I, there's still half the panel I haven't heard from, but. <laughs> All right, either you want to chime in? I'll just, I'll 
just add that uh, the four partners will get a share on the answer. We don't have to answer because they've no. said everything. So. They said everything. Okay, yeah. good. Thank right. you. Yeah, the other thing we're not going to do as a panel is like, you know, panels are always like, oh, I agree with what she said. Uh, someone in here wanted to speak up? How important do you think it is to have a dedicated innovation team as opposed to just trying to embed innovation into the culture of existing business units? Can you tell us what company you're from and what, what industry? Yes, um, I am Curtis Chesney, work in North Carolina in uh, financial services, life insurance and annuities All right. with Lincoln Financial. Yeah, let me just take well, I've, I've worked in five innovation groups, labs, and so I've five times had the luxury of being in a dedicated group which, where they think about innovation. And you know, one was based, it was, based in Silicon Valley, and it was its autonomous group linked to Stanford. One was at Motorola, one was at MIT, um, one was at, with DARPA, Department of Defense, and then Mayo. So I've had the luxury of doing this five times, and it's pretty effective. So I haven't ever had the experience of not doing it, but I've also had the experience of being in an agency where people kind of buy in consulting services around innovation. And they're, it's like night and day. It's so different in terms of being embedded and um, it, there's two things. It's you're embedded, so you, you're more accountable for your actions, and so you have to think more long term. So you have to really think about you're in it for the long run, and so it's a lot about building relationships and building credibility. Um, but you also you're you have to um, you're not as interesting to people as consultants. So once you're internal, you're not quite as fascinating as the people that come in from outside. And so you really have to navigate that as well. And you can be really impacted by the culture. So if you're internal, you can get kind of ground down by the culture. So it's, you know, you have to, I, I um, do a lot of work protecting my team from becoming too, too affected by um, the culture we're in because they have to push against it all the time. And there's an interesting thing about being embedded as well, that if, if uh, from a career, career perspective, we have this, we have this term um, career limiting move that we, ha we make like 10 times a day. So someone goes, oh, that was a clear, career limiting move, which means that you're in as an agitator, you're actually on staff, and everyone around you is saying, you know, you shouldn't have done that. I mean, that's, you know, if you want to stay at Mayo and if you want to you know, be here for 30 years. And so you're, you're kind of in, but your job is to be an agitator. So. You, a lot of people find that really difficult in terms of being on staff, but actually kind of going up against the status quo. Um, and it's easier as a consultant because you're more protected. I mean, you walk back and you go back to your job. And so there is huge gain in being embedded. Um, but I think it comes with a lot of, there's a lot of trade-offs. Um, but I think the, out, the output is much better for, the comp for a company. And it, it sounds like you were also getting to, like, is it better or worse to have it? kind of a, a group of people versus to be like one innovation leader that's trying to kind of uh, build allies or, or get converts throughout the organization? Yes, ish. so I'm on a team of three that's full-time innovation and we are working with the core business units around the company. But what I'm wondering long-term is how important will it be for us to exist as an independent full-time innovation team versus training and handing off those skills to the leaders of the existing business lines? From, a, from my perspective, some form of innovation team will always be necessary, and, and that's an evolution. Uh, and I think the structure of that team may change over time. I mean, I think if you've embedded the innovation practice and people are doing it, then you might focus your efforts on in what stages are the businesses in, what should our next frontier be? Uh, and what type of skill sets and capabilities we need to bring to advance our cap capabilities. So uh, I don't think a fully embedded approach will necessarily be sustainable, uh, just given rotation and changes in the business. Uh, so my answer will be that there's always going to be some form of, uh, of innovation team. It's kind of carrying the torch and, you know, keeping, keeping the flame, keeping the flame alive. Keeping yeah. Flame alive. But, but as, uh, as Lorna mentioned also, uh, if you're part of a business unit, then the pressures are just different on you. Your, your permissions are different. You know, the expectations of you are different. So, you know, having all come from dedicated innovation units, we probably have a, a bias, but I think it's, a, it's the right way to do it. 
Um, I was at, I was visiting uh, the tech company VMware in Cambridge. They had the California company, but they have kind of an R and D outpost here in Cambridge, and they had this interesting process. This is changing the subject a little bit, but you know, internal venture funding, where they would kind of, in doing innovation, they would find people in the business units, um, either business people or programmers who had a great idea, you know, either for a new product or maybe an entirely new business and they would kind of pull them out of the business unit for a while and find them separate office space and find them funding, which I thought was kind of, you know, was sort of a cool way to, to take you out of the, like, the pressures that you were talking about of, you know, are you, are you still doing your day job and are you still meeting your numbers kind of stuff, um, almost sort of creating this uh, incubator, hermetically sealed environment where you could spend a couple quarters or a year developing your idea. Uh, some other people who are bold enough and want to tell us about kind of what they're working on and how this group of uh, superheroes can help. Hi, th this is Christina Mott. I work for Marshall McLennan Company's professional services firm. I was interested in hearing about how you approach innovation outside of the U.S. Um, I can start. Uh, our a global team works with every region. A group we have four major regions: so Asia, Europe, uh, North America, and Latin America. The process is the same. Um, the levels, the level of seriousness that uh, each team has, and uh, the way they actually execute the process is very different. Uh, for me, it's one of the most fascinating, fascinating things is to go and run projects in the different regions, and, um, and I think. Uh, is just trying to adapt to the culture uh, on, and how they uh, uh, absorb and get context uh, to understand your, your, uh, your insights and then being able to generate ideas. Uh, many times you're looking for a more structured process to go and ask people to give you their ideas. I think in the case of Asia, for example, in China, we're very structured. In um, Latin America, it's very chaotic, but things happen. Um, so in my perspective, the, the common language works, but uh, you need to do some adaptations to uh, tailor to the specific cultural aspects that each region has. I don't know if uh, you guys have anything to add. Yeah, I, I would say we, Goodyear aspires to be a global company, but there are, and we are innovation team. I have people in, uh, in three regions, and when, when we work on uh, a new solution, we try to make it global, but the reality is that the environments are so different that the same concept may have to be implemented in a very different way. So we're working on one concept right now. We're incubating it in the U.S., but we have to rework some of the aspects of the business model to implement it in Europe, where we have a very different infrastructure. And we'll have to do something even different in Latin America. So there's a, there's a the aspiration is, uh, is different from the reality for reasons that relate partly to our culture and partly to the fact that the regions are different. Yes. So, Lorna, are, are all the Mayo Clinic facilities in the U.S. or are there some outside the U.S.? No, we, we, we have offices outside the U.S., but they're more kind of coordinating groups that would then bring, we have a lot of foreign um, visitors, but we don't have, we don't practice outside the U.S. We have Arizona and Florida, the two other clinics, um, and Rochester, and then we have the health system, which I think is maybe we have like 80 uh, hospitals and clinic in the health system in the kind of neighboring uh, states. And we're on a, we're kind of on a, a bit of a shopping spree. We've been kind of partnering now. We've moved from um, being acquisitive and, and buying up organizations to partnering. So we now have a new initiative around um, affiliated pr practice network provider network, which is really interesting. We're, we're a little bit letting go of control and saying it's okay to partner rather than own. And it's a really relaxing of the you know, Mayo's perception of quality control. They thought we have to always buy it to be able to run it ourselves. And now we're moving into that partnering space, which is good for us. But If I uh, may add one more thing, I, I mean, as you were talking, something else came to mind. Uh, one thing that we haven't touched much upon uh, throughout the dates. Uh, one element that I think is very important to innovation and many times is underseen in its um, the skill set of facilitation. You know, there are many innovation facilitators that I think is under, an undervalued uh, skill in innovation. Uh, but when it comes to working with regions, I think that's a very essential key to success. Uh, if you go to uh, Europe, you have to have a very strong facilitator that can shut someone up and ask someone else for opinion. 
uh, as opposed to China, where you have to pull people to, uh, to, to offer their, their input. So that aspect, I think, in innovation is very often uh, undervalued, uh, very important to success. What do you have to do in Latin America? Just party. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Just join them. You need a facilitator that can stay up late. Right? <laughs> Uh, how about back here? Uh, we'll go to the back and then to the front. And just quickly to mention, I know that Lorna has a flight to catch pretty soon, so, but this may be one of the last questions that you can take, right? Yeah, so in 15 minutes. Okay. 15 minutes. Let's okay. try to get these next two in front. So just a quick question on, um, on the whole notion of rewarding for ideas. I've, I've read a lot of conflicting literature on that. Some say you should be rewarding employees for ideas, and others say recognition is the ultimate reward. I'd like to hear the, the group's um, opinions on that. Oh, I, I'd say the way we look at it is that being recognized as an expert among your peers is one of the most powerful sources of recognition or reward, especially in a company with a long tenure and a very collaborative culture, which is what we have. And so uh, our, t our employees are long, long tenured. Average partner tenure is over 25 years. And so that, that recognition is very powerful. And I think in a lot of ways from a compensation perspective, the innovation function typically doesn't have a huge say on comp, but what you can do is advocate and be a strong voice for promotions. And if you're uh, independent and up in the organization, you can get to the decision makers on promotions. I think in a lot of ways, recognition is really important. And if you think about status, um, we have these uh, coffee mugs. Uh, they're $4 on Vistaprint. They have our logo on them. And we hand them out, we award them to people who make a meaningful contribution to the firm's innovation efforts as defined by us. I have a spreadsheet. There's about 100 people who've won them. A and, you know, they make everything you drink taste better. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of like the, the funny things people do for status. It's air frequent flyer miles or status or platinum cards and what have you. And it's super powerful because now you have a brand ambassador, someone who can walk around uh, with, the, with the mug, and, and they're very proud of it. And if you look in people's offices or at their desks, a lot of what they have up there are some sort of recognition items or trophies or plaques or something from previous things that went well, the investment banker deal toy is sort of the classic example. And I think those types of things are, are very important to, to build the brand, to build the cultural movement, have the awareness. When we fund things as well, we have these giant foam checks, the, the lot of winner size foam checks. And I have the, the double secret check writing authority for the big foam checks. And our controllers division will actually effectively cash them and give them to your budget if you bring them. It's actually a, the, I have the biggest checkbook in the bank, you know, and so chuckle, 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 but people get a kick out of it, and I've got these big foam checks that I walk around with, and people are like, oh, I want the check, I want the trophy, I want the mug, a and they want that status and recognition, or we have a culture of innovation award that goes out to the whole firm when, we, when someone makes a really disproportionate contribution. Uh, we announce all the winners when we fund stuff. So there's a lot of things, I think, that are really important, and it's a broader holistic view. It's not just... Um, you know, pay them more versus not. I think you need a whole range of options and giving people, if you can advance their careers and help build their skills, you know, however that ends up manifesting itself over time, it clearly will be professional advancement. But I think you really have to look at it as, as a, a broader, um, broader view. I think particularly for us at Mayo, the reason that it's important to acknowledge people's contribution is because we are, again, trying to, you know, you're trying to, we're trying to, um, disrupt a status quo that is really hierarchical. And so there's a perception that all the good ideas come from you know, physicians or senior leadership. And so I, I think we, we celebrate um, moments where we can get the kind of what we call frontline staff to really engage with the idea that they, ha that they, they can own the future of the clinic or they own, can own the future of the organization. So I think we do it more overtly for that reason as a way of challenging the culture than thinking it's really about that individual. It's more about starting to send signals to into the culture about you know, where it, good ideas can come from. So we run, I think I mentioned during my talk, this, uh, this thing code, it's the kind of seed funding for um, groups to, uh, to kind of write a proposal and come with a team and ask. And they're very, very interesting because they, they are frequently come out of the hospital. We notice a disproportionate amount come of nursing and so you start to understand who are the people who are you know, most in need of change and who are most feeling the um, urgency around change or needing new tools. And so they'll, there's lots of nurses come together. They'll pitch a great idea. Um, they're great to work with. And so we, we end up loading a lot more of our work um, around nursing. And then when we choose projects to work on, they're very physician-led and they're very political. So if you looked at our portfolio, you'd say when we touch nursing, it's through them coming to us and us giving them funding. When we touch the, the clinic and it's pro it's the providers who are all physicians, 
it's a really political thing. So we have to really kind of try and message in different ways to say we think the nursing community are as viable as a, so a resource to us as the 11th floor executive. So it's more that reason we do it. Is, is there anything visible you do or financial or promotion oriented kind of when people participate in these programs? Um, or do you have like a green tea mug that you give out at the Mayo Clinic? We give them lots of things. You know, they, get, they get lots of code things. They get time with us, which they love. Um, we, what's interesting, we, the first few years we did it, we publicized it and we thought we just gave them money and, and a kind of a title in terms of they were re recipients of this award. And when they went back to their kind of home departments, we, we kind of in, we in, discovered that, they were, that there was a lot of pushback to them actually kind of fill, fulfilling that role because it hadn't come through the right channels. So, so they independently had gone for funding, got funding. We were celebrating them. The heads of their departments, you know, hadn't ap approved and anointed this celebration. So we now have to work indirectly through them and make sure there's support inside the department before we can elevate a person. And it's, it's, it's not right. But they were being, there was, there was like, the people were sabotaging their grants, <laughs> essentially, or not supporting them. Um, because we had the protocols hadn't been, the right protocols hadn't been, you know, because it's it's shifting power around. It's saying we're taking the power from here. We're going to give it to a group of nurses, and we're going to we're going to talk about your capacity to function in a way that you haven't been functioning before. And you're going to you know, you essentially you may save the institution. I mean, um, we have some great nursing facilities. I, I I would say, and I think it echoes what other people are saying. The the, the thing that most motivates people is. For their uh, what their work to actually come to fruition, for the company to support it, for it to move forward, to see whatever it is in uh, in actual use, uh, and then the second thing I would say is more informal ways of acknowledgement: your checks and your and your coffee mugs, but just dropping by and talking to someone and saying, "That was really cool what you what you just talked about." The things that are you know formal reward systems, I think can be demotivators if they're not extremely well uh, managed. I don't have anything to add. All right, let's go. Someone up front had a question, comment, problem. Um, so to what degree do your organizations um, co-innovate or collaborate with third parties beyond consumers to generate uh, and or uh, assess, prototype, commercialize scale, um, new ideas, whether it's products and services or um, process changes and things of that nature? We, we do a lot of that. So it's a, it, you know, we'll, we will prototype, we'll go out, we'll trial something with a customer when it's way premature. We're doing experiments with the world, uh, whether something exists or might exist or can be simulated to try to learn whether people like, don't like what it's, uh, what it's, uh, what they uh, like. So we do uh, quite a bit of that, whether it's um, in stores or, or with drivers on, uh, on tracks or in mines. And I, you know, I, I think we could do more, but I think that ob observing, collaborating with, experimenting with throughout the process, customers is what will drive. Uh, uh, but beyond customers. Beyond so for customers, example, sorry. Um, an emerging technology company or MIT, an academic institution, or possibly, I don't know, a venture capitalist who, I know you have your sort of your own internal venture capital mindset, yeah. but to the extent that you work with institutions, let's say, not, not the consumers. So uh, I, I guess it's, uh, it, it's very dependent on, in our case, on, the on what we're doing. We oftentimes will collaborate with another company that's a materials supplier and try to co-create with them materials for a new application or with uh, we don't have deep confidence in things like apps we'll uh, we'll collaborate as we're trying to look at you know intelligent vehicles with people who are small companies in that kind kind of a space so we do a bit of that type of work sure from uh, from our, our perspective um, it comes in many different dimensions i think of uh, where you are uh, when it comes to looking at technologies and uh, so on and so forth, there is a group on the advanced development team, basically R&E, that uh, is looking at the technology needs from all the businesses. 
and the businesses define their needs based on the platter, innovation platforms that they have. So they're just scouting for opportunities that to, to close gaps in knowledge and to close gaps in, in actual technology. So that's the forefront of that. Then there's uh, also an element uh, just of insight that comes from complementers of our business. For example, um, if you think about the refrigerator, refrigeration business, you, know, you think about all the uh, things that go inside the refrigerator and how they see the refrigerators from a very different angle. So you can think of a craft that makes frozen products, for example. And we work a lot with companies like that that can give us a different perspective of our own product. And, and then we are also partnered with some companies to go to market together on things that deliver va consumer value from a different perspective. So it really comes in different dimensions. I think the, the key to making that sustainable is really trying to embed some of these questions throughout the process and force people to think not only I have to do it, but what other considerations I can have to accelerate my development or even find efficiencies, because not, I mean, you don't have resources for everything. So many times we're doing things that are very important for others, so how can we uh, complement our efforts? We have um, okay. uh, two different models that I can think of. One is that we have a consortium model that we use around, um, we've experimenting with looking at the area of aging in place, you know, and this, this whole idea of, um, assisted living, but, but also like aging at home. And we have a lab and we have a kind of strong competency of Mayo around kind of geriatricians, but we wanted to really think about, again, from the, the, the user's perspective, we know about the process of aging in terms of degenerative, clinically degenerative, but what's the experience of that? Um, and how do you support that? So we ended up um, pitching it to a group of like-minded, in people in other industries who are interested in aging, so we have General Mills, Target, Oh, I can't remember. There's a name of a big. Um, there's a huge organization around assisted living. We have. Um, we're, I think we may have be signing a pharmacy really soon, and it's just that idea that these are all people who are you know the, with the boom with the baby boomers. These are all industries that have a shared interest and appetite, and it's not unlike the the MIT model of you know if we can do the research, they can they can fund the research for us, and so we now get external funding into our lab. At Center for Innovation to look at this area of aging in place and kind of, you know, kind of really vibrant living. Um, and then the other model we've done is we've partnered with uh, um, Rock Health in the Bay Area, and they're mostly a startup for um, apps, just mostly IT and health. And we were one of the, f we were the first medical group to partner with them. And so when they, they did their first call for, for um, applications and they had lots of different developers just pitching ideas. And so they would come and pitch to us an idea that they would, that would have some potentially have some, you know, value in a clinical setting or with, for a patient. And we were able to critique it from a, you know, a perspective where we were, we were pretty harsh on them, you know, because they were wonderfully naive about how medicine works and how the system works. And so, but it became a really great relationship because we were able to push back much harder on them in terms of developing tools that don't integrate or developing tools that often can create, you know, mixed messaging for patients and often can be more dangerous. And so really being able to feed them back the information they need. So we, we've had a three-year relationship with Rock Health now, and we now move some of the, their products into the clinic. We partner with them. So if we see a really good product, we'll partner it with like pediatrics. So we'll bring them into transplant reach, and we'll take one of their apps, and they're now using it. So it's kind of we find them, and then they get refined in because they're in a clinical setting. So it's a great relationship. And I think we'll continue to do things like that, just to try and you know, leverage strategic partnerships as much as possible. Just to tag on to that a little bit, I mean, I think most cities now, Boston and New York and San Francisco and Austin, like all have these accelerator programs like Rock Health and yeah. Techstars and Y Combinator, and they're like desperate for corporate involvement, you know, like for any large company to come in and just give them that reality yeah. check of like, yeah, this would actually be useful yeah. or no, you'd want to build those kind of features. So, I mean, it's a great way to yeah. get a view of like what are 10 or 12 startups doing by just spending a day with them. It's great. I mean, they do a lot of quick work, for, and in a way, we get we benefit because they do it really quickly. And you know, we can say no to 90 percent, but 10 percent we say yes to. We could have never developed ourselves. I, I just have one comment on it, which is, when you're doing this very aggressively, you want to be thinking about what your business model is, because the partners that you choose won't necessarily just be the ones that happen to have the technical capability that you need. Uh, you want to make sure that in the end you're creating enough value for both of you to win. So 
Okay, let's see. Is there one last person who wants to volunteer, chime in? Okay, let's do these two last ones. We'll try to be, we'll try to be briefer if you'll be uh, brief too. Yes, okay. go ahead. Okay. Well, Hi. just to, uh, let's, um, do, let's do the front, in front and then back. In the, in okay. the Hi. Um, my name is Raghav Chavla. I work at Fidelity Investments. And I lead the uh, innovation program for the corporate technology group. And my innovation team consists of me. Um, so, and I'm not sure if my problem is really solvable without throwing more money or people at it, but I figured I'd ask anyway. So uh, my organization is entirely internal facing, so our customers are other business owners within Fidelity. And uh, so everyone's time is 100% allocated and they, it's, it's, it's billed out to the revenue generating business units. So when I get ideas that are ready to be implemented, it's really hard for me to find people who can well, work on them and implement them. And sometimes, sometimes I do find passionate volunteers who kind of help take the idea forward and then we find a home for it after, after it's incubated. But a lot of times, like the question I get from people is, so uh, where do I build my time? And I'm like, I don't know. And I do have a non-labor budget, so if any, any infrastructure or, or, or software uh, uh, that people need to purchase, that's fine, but it's just the time that's the issue. And issue. zero headcount budget at all. Yeah, exactly, so, so that's, uh, my, that's my biggest problem. An idea, an idea we've been playing with, uh, which is easier said than, said than done, is um, to, to find entrepreneurs that will be willing to incubate that in their own business, potentially as a, an individual entity. I guess it depends on the nature of the opportunity. And uh, have them actually share the, the, the wealth, if you will, once that takes off, you can either acquire the company. So that's a model that uh, some companies use to really avoid the, uh, the corporate issue of trying to fight for your resources. Uh, so can you find the right opportunities that could be used in that model. And, uh, and maybe some of the uh, initiatives that, like you were saying, um, like for example, Grand Rapids has this thing called Start Garden, and, and they use funding opportunities. So if the opportunity is good enough for a business to get it started, and then it's serving a common purpose for you, then at some point you can bring that into your business. Or that can go and spin off, potentially. Just one tactical point. I mean, I know Fidelity has an extraordinary innovation function, and you know, Sean Belk and Rick Smyers and Danielle Duplin. I mean, there's, I think, 64 of them now. So I'd also reach out to them and see what they can do to help because I know they're big, strong advocates. I work with them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just as a, as a, I mean, obviously, your hands are tied to some extent. You might be able to propose a simple experiment that just says, can we just put a tracking code in place and see where it goes for six months? And I, uh, and then, you know, my guess is it'll be very tolerable and uh, you can move from there. Or, or could you get, I wonder if you could get like little sabbaticals from technology people, you know, could I just have three months of your time if you're, work, if you're in between projects or you're bored or you want to change, you know, could I have a succession of people for three months and see how you could move the needle? Yes? Yeah. So, um, see, so Nat Bulkley and I, uh, until recently, was at Pfizer. Uh, the question, I was interested in your perspectives. Uh, you all clearly have done a really good job of getting buy-in from the top level of the organization. And I was curious how your perception of the central problem you're solving in your job, what was the basis of that, uh, you know, how you see that, and if that is the same now as when you started the job. Question makes sense. Yeah. So, the, how do you think about the central problem, your raison d'être, and the organization, and is that different from when you started the job? Bill, why don't you start? I, I'd say that having a, a constituency that's mindful of the future is, is really important, and I think that uh, much of the organization is, is the science of delivery, and they are so focused on doing incredible things for clients that there really isn't the time or the incentives or the structure in place to really look beyond that tactical day-to-day -day and incremental. And I think that if you think about long cycle entrepreneurship, you really need to have that group of people that's out there running the experiments, figuring out what's over the horizon and, and what will hopefully be coming next. And I think that uh, that's really why we are, we're, we're effectively catalysts for long cycle entrepreneurship and um, I enabling us to have that, that longer term vision that our core business just doesn't have the capacity for. And has that changed since 2010, or it's pretty much the same? 
It's, this, it's the same vision. I think we, we've certainly learned a lot more about the organization. We're going about it in different ways, but the, the broader long-term macro goal, and in a firm with two centuries of history, a few years are just the blink of an eye in, the, in their mind, and it kills me to lose a week. So I think it's sort of a you know, time horizon uh, alignment as well, but I think it's, you know, the, the goals are the same. I think we're, we're getting ever wiser in how we approach them. Uh, from our perspective, uh, EI has changed over time and really has to do a lot with the sign of the times. Uh, I share with you the innovation journey we're in, and, and when I started this journey, personally, it was about reinjecting and reinvigorating the, the competency, and now it's really about making it sustainable and inescapable. Uh, so the uh, types of things that we do vary, and I'm sure probably next year might be a little bit different. So there's always, uh, I think, uh, an understanding of reading the organization organization's priorities and being flexible enough to make your own initiatives address those needs. I, I've only been at Goodyear for a year, but the, uh, the, the, it has changed a little bit. At the beginning, the focus was on uh, growth and adjacencies and new businesses, and I think we've uh, found that there's significant potential to look at new business models in the core to drive value, and those still require a lot of the same skills. but. Uh, so that's more emphasis than I expected when we started. Um, I think a lot of things have changed. I've been at Mayo four years, and in that time we've gone from, the, the, the landscape of healthcare has radically shifted. So, you know, when I started there, there wasn't, we, we had the two of our best financial years ever, the first two years I was there. So, you know, you then have a culture where there's not a lot of appetite for change because there's not a lot of evidence or urgency around it. And, you know, if, if an organization is also 148 years old and has been doing the same thing. There doesn't seem to be any indication that they need to do anything different. And so we were kind of, I describe it to my team a bit like in training for a marathon where we could see it coming. And so we were using the time, I kept saying, use the time to really get to know the clinic and get to know how it works and get to know, you know how, how to try and affect it because we're going to have to sprint at some point. And that happened probably about six months ago when there was just such a constellation of disruptors that started to, first of all, they were the kind of boogeyman that people were describing, you know, accountable care or payment reform or Obamacare, and no one really understood. But then those in aggregate became this, like, really disruptive landscape. And so we're now um, really, really busy. Um, but what's curious in terms of how, so our work is completely different. We're, but we're now navigating um, really conservative anxiety and bad decision making. So we kind of have the answer, and we've been trying to figure out ways of communicating the kind of way out of this in terms of through the way, you know, through this and, and long-term growth and sustainability and, and um, just, you know, a kind of vibrant future that's different, that will demand destruction, and we've tried to describe it, and, and it just so happens that the culture we're in, it, um, are, are so agitated by what's currently happening that the, the capacity to make those decisions is really hard. Um, so where I would say right now the conversation is really trying to get to create, I mentioned this idea of creating evidence for decision making. We're trying to keep telling the same story different ways and trying to figure out if we, what way can we tell the story that someone can actually connect with it and then start making some decisions to move towards it. So we story tell a lot and we create loads of charts and we, you know, do scenarios and we, we do, we look at other industries and talk about do the cautionary tale and we talk about you know, the trajectory for Mayo and market analysis and stuff. We do a lot of stuff to try and um, literally create enough evidence that this community can make some decisions. And so we're, that's where we are right now. It's, I would say our work is you know, very different than it was a year ago. Well, I think that's maybe a great question to wrap on just because it, sort of, it sort of plugs into the, you know, this kind of oh, evolving okay. role it's a great question for Lorna to wrap on, too. Uh, she'll, she's actually going to call in to the rest of the panel from her taxi cab. Um, so uh, why don't we wrap up there, and we'll hand things back to Luis. But I want to thank these four amazing panelists, and thank, thank you, you thank for you, all your thank questions. You. Thank you. Good job.